Alrighty, guys, welcome back to Sondervell Voices. I am with Martin Fletcher today, uh, who I actually met doing the MDS, and we're going to get into the full story in a minute, but he had one of the best goals that I have ever heard to date, and, uh, and so we're going to sort of find out the origins and then talk about up until today how he sort of progressed towards that goal. So... Fletch, I assume you prefer to be... T- yeah, Fletch works. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome, Fletch. <laughs> Cheers, mate. Thanks good for to see time. you again. Yeah, mate. It has been good. First yeah. time we're catching up since yeah. then as well. Since we were in the desert together. Uh, how's life been since you've been back? Yeah, good, mate. Good. It's always funny how things return to normal pretty quickly, don't they? Yeah. Even if you have these amazing experiences, you're still going back to something and... Uh, yeah, it doesn't last long, that glow, before you feel like you want to do the next thing, right? Yeah, because when you finished MDS, you went to Marrakesh, is that right? Uh, yeah, we had a night in Marrakesh. Night in Mar- Marrakesh, yeah. and then straight home? I was straight home. I, I actually had to hightail out. It was my daughter's birthday. Okay. Um, and one of the previous challenges that I'd done, I ended up missing her first Christmas. Okay. So I'm on borrowed time with her as it is. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, so I had to head back pretty quickly. I assume you made it back in time as <laughs> yeah, well. I did. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, awesome, yeah, I did. Awesome. Yeah, it was pretty cool. So I've obviously teased him with it a little bit and um, I might give my perspective to begin with. Yeah, But sure. the first time I heard about the big goal that you were working to was when we we're all on that bus. So we yeah. got on the bus and then we sat there and everyone started to sort of share a little bit about themselves and it's, things slowly started to creep out. And I remember when you said what you were working towards, I just thought that is a massive goal. And obviously not knowing you prior, I was like, I wonder if it's just starting you know is this their first step are they halfway there are they or is all it the way there yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah or is it a good way to fundraise to go to their <laughs> mbs yeah, yeah. but um but may, maybe tell us what that big goal is what i'm referring to so the, the goal that me myself and the group of guys that i kind of operate with um is raising a million bucks for black dog which i don't know if you know but black dogs the it's the only mental health research facility in Australia. So okay. they're the guys who are on the front line actually trying to research the underpinning causes of mental health mm-hmm. all the way from adolescence all the way through to adults. So for us, yeah, we're, we're on what is now into its fifth year okay. and we're on this journey to raise a million bucks. It's incredible. That is such an audacious goal. Like that is a big, big goal. Yeah, we it's haven't a- hit it. <laughs> we're not there which maybe we're going to talk about you, a little you bit you can now. say anything really <laughs> but yeah no. So, so when you say you and the guys who who's the who's the core group of people that you're working with so there's there's um so so we 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 refer to ourselves as the the road less traveled adventure team or expedition okay. team um which is a loose team of i mean it's not really hard and fast it's anyone really that's stupid enough to come on the adventures that we are setting okay um uh so there's probably six or seven core guys yep. with a fringe of probably another three or four guys that are kind of expressing interest in various different things yeah which is like sparked my interest when yeah, i heard yeah. it i was like what how do going? i get a part of this <laughs> yeah. this is unreal for such a good cause and you're doing some incredible things along the way as well and i think that's it yeah so it started um it started with our, uh, this sort of audacious goal that we had, which was to row across the Atlantic Ocean. Mm-hmm. Um, four blokes having never, not, I think one of us had rowed at school. <laughs> and I, I certainly had never touched an oar before we decided to do that. Um, and then really, it was just off the back of that, we got some corporate interest, got a bit of sponsorship there. And then we sort of realized, okay, well, if we can swing for the fences in terms of these challenges, why not swing for the fences in terms of this audacious fundraising goal that we've got? Mate, how did the rowing across the Atlantic even pop up? Like, how did was that your first thing that you did? Kind of. I mean, I, I, I've always been I've always been intrigued by adventure. Okay. And I've also found I've also found that I've always been kind of at my most happy, my most calm, my most focused, my most you know, having most clarity in my life when I've been doing really, really adventurous stuff. Awesome. So, you know, it's taken me to, I lived in Nepal for a, you know, year and a half when I was 19. Okay. You know, um, I've done a couple of things. We did, a, I did a Yukon, I did the Yukon River Quest, which was a 750 kilometer kayaking race with a mate that goes up through British Columbia into, Al- into the Alaskan border. That was pretty cool. When was that? That was 2015. Okay. We did that. Um, but really, we were just sitting around and we were, I was thinking, right, it's been a few years, you know, did, did a couple of those things, but then fell into corporate life, yep. got a corporate job, 
you know, was living in Sydney, absolutely nothing wrong with my life, but definitely was feeling kind of disengaged and a bit like, you know, you hit 30 and you're like, well, is this it? Mm-hmm. You know, is this going to be it until I'm 70? Yeah. And then uh, I, I was on a plane and I just read this article that said that more people had climbed Everest than had rowed across an ocean. I okay. was just like, bang, well, that's, that's it. what we need to do. <laughs> that's what we need to do. And, um, and then it just became a case of finding three other blokes that were stupid enough to want to do it. I want to dive into this because there's so (laughs) many logistics that it goes for crossing the Atlantic Ocean, rowing across the Atlantic Ocean. Like once you read that article, what was your next step? Was it obviously find the people? Like how do you find the boat? You know, talk us through just like before we get to the race, all the logistics leading up to it. Well, it was, it was, I I remember it was, it was about a two year journey from the moment we paid our deposit for the race to getting to the start line. It was about two years. So it was a big, big undertaking. Um, I had one of the guys who you've met, Gracie, who came mm. came to the desert with us. Yeah, um, who's uh, who's a good, you know, he's the guy that will always say yes. Yeah, doesn't matter <laughs> yeah. what it is. That's right? not surprising. And you, say that. you know, and like anything, I waited until we were probably ten beers down in the pub before I <laughs> posed it to him. Yeah, and he was straight in. And then and then I had a friend, and he had a friend who we both kind of knew, but you know, there was sort of definitely more his, and you know, and then we that was the team. Um. I mean, in terms of the logistics, I look back now and I think, I think about how many things had to go right for us to even get to the start line, let yeah. alone the finish line, yeah. and how many things should have gone wrong, yeah. and how in challenges that we've tried since, how many things have gone wrong. So we would just <laughs> call it beginner's look, luck or, you know, putting yourself out there into the universe and getting good stuff back. I don't know what it was, but we, we ended up... Um, we, we, we found a boat from a... It, so it, the, the, the Talisker Atlantic Challenge is a yearly race. Okay. And there's probably a fleet of maybe 30 boats that do it, give or take. Mm-hmm. So there's obviously a limited number of ocean rowing boats in the world. And I think we'd found one in Antigua, which is the Caribbean's the finish line. So we'd found one in Antigua from a previous race. And we, we ended up buying that boat and... Uh, and shipping it back to Australia so we oh, could train on it through the winter. Okay, so yeah. you didn't train and then go across, get the boat. No. Um, you shipped it uh, yeah, back we shipped to Australia. It. And that was, and that was a big, there was a big sort of thing about should we, shouldn't we. It actually ended up being the best thing we possibly could have done was okay. have that boat down here because, yep. you know, you will know this from the, the Marathon de Saab. Then it's not a, it's not a running race. It's, it's an expedition. It's yeah. a war of attrition, right? And it's yeah. exactly the same thing with the Talisker Atlantic Challenge. It's, okay. it's not a rowing event. It's a, you know, we were, we were 35 days at sea. <laughs> and, you know, nothing can, And some people are out there for, you know, 90 days, right? So there's nothing that really can, you know, there's a point where you can row all you want. But it's, it's about managing your own head, managing your own body, being prepared for the worst case scenario, all that kind of stuff. Relationships on the boat. Relationships on the boat, yeah. exactly. So when you brought the boat over to Australia, <coughs> can you give paint a picture of what the boat actually looks like? Because I'm picturing, you know, like a, a, a surf boat rowing, yep. you know, which I can't imagine it is very similar to that. Yeah, it's, it's um, the, the rowing boat is, I think it's 26 foot long. Okay. Um, kind of looks like a long cigar. Yep. It's got a... Um, a small cabin at the front, small cabin at the back, and then the rest of it is just open and exposed. Okay. So it's got three rowing positions with movable rowing seats. So right. the rowing seats are on skateboard wheels. And so how, how many of you rowing at a time? So um, the the gen- generally we were two on, we were two rowing, two sleeping. Okay. And you row in shifts of two hours. Okay. So you do two hours on, two hours off, and you do that round the clock. For 35 for days. For 35 days. Seven days a week, 35 days, yeah. My God. Yeah. Um, the, the one thing we did do was we rode, for the first couple of days, we actually rode three up. Okay. So we just wanted to, we, we didn't have a massive goal in mind, um, which is ridiculous because we actually ended up setting an Australian record for the fastest ever crossing <laughs> of the Atlantic Ocean, <laughs> which is genuinely ridiculous when, when I say that, like genuinely ridiculous. Um, um, but we did want to give it our best shot. Yeah. And... One of the things I think that really helped us was having a shared set of values. And one of those values was we wanted to step off that boat knowing that we'd given it our absolute all. Okay. So for the first two days, we actually rode with three guys and one guy resting, which means you had 45 minutes. Yeah. Um, and that kind of poked our nose out in front. And then we found ourselves sort of, you know, right at the head of the pack. You said before that like a lot of you hadn't rode before. 
And then you go there, you set an Australian record, which you said is ridiculous, which is absolutely awesome that you did that. <laughs> like when you had two years from when you signed up to when you go, were you, were you going in pretty confident that you're going to do well or were you going in confident that you were going to finish? Like where did your confidence level sit going into the race? If you can think back to before you started. We had no idea. So, so the thing about this race is it's, um, it attracts a lot of people from the UK, attracts a lot of people from Europe, from, from America. Okay. Um, but, but we were... We had no idea. So a lot of those, they, they run group training camps for this race and stuff where people go to the Mediterranean or they go to the UK. And, and we were just on our own. I remember we had to do our kit check. So our mandatory kit check, we were parked in a car park in Rose Bay <laughs> at, at midnight. At midnight in the middle of winter with um, the floodlights from the car park. So yeah. it was illuminating our boat. And we had the chief safety officer of the race who was based in the UK on FaceTime. That's how kind of You're departed just showing we, him. And we were just like, there's our life jackets. There's the bilge pump. There's this. So it was, we were that departed. Um, we had no idea of how we were going to perform. Like absolutely no idea. If you knew then what you know now, do you think you still would have went through with it? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, okay. Yeah, 100%. Okay. And we had, some, we had some gnarly times. Like three quarters of the way through the race, there was the – there was a storm that came, a tropical storm that came through that grounded every cruise ship in the Caribbean. And we were bobbing around like a cork 700 miles from the Caribbean, getting tossed around in this, in this storm. You know, um, we, we, at one point our boat got fully flipped over and capsized in the middle of the night. It was, it was so, it was so gnarly. The middle of the night you capsized yeah. 700 miles. Yeah. Yeah. Out to sea. Yeah. I was, what, where yeah. were you? Were you rowing? I was rowing. You? Yeah, okay. it was myself and, a, it, myself and another one of the guys, Cam. We were on the sticks. Is that where you wanted to be? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Because we just got chucked off into the water, which I know sounds like a less than ideal situation, but you're that close to the Caribbean. The water's it's, it's pretty warm. <laughs> <laughs> it's pitch black, so you've got no real concept of where you are. Um, and the guys in the cabins, they're, they're the ones with all the equipment. So Gracie, who you know... Um, he was, you know, he was fast asleep and then all of a sudden he's on, he's on the roof of the cabin and one of the other guys had the toolbox. So he took a hammer to the head. So it's like, you know, it's that old sailing adage, right? It's not, it's not the sea that's going to, it's the other things around that you can hit, you know, or they can hit you. And were the cabins sealed? Did yes. they start to fill with water or they're, they're completely watertight? They're tight? completely watertight. Okay. So the, the thinking is, is that the boat's not only self-writing, but if you chop the boat in half, then the two cabins will float. Okay, yeah. okay. So that's the thinking behind their design. So when it capsized, what was your first thought? Yeah, just, yeah. Like, like panic, fear? Did you... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all of the above. Yeah, all of the above. Yeah. I think, um, I, I mean, you know, it's like a, it sounds like a very cliched story, but I just, just heard Cam just shout top of his voice and then looked over and there's just this huge wave coming down on top of us. And then the next thing you know, you're upside down, you're in the water. But it, I think the strange thing is, like, I, I, I remember y you have a deck light, right? And it's just the moonlight and the deck light. Mm -hmm. And the boat capsized and we all got over and we all checked that we were all okay. And then, then you just, that's it, you're just back rowing again. Yeah. And then you're just it. watching all of your stuff that's become your friend. You know, just float off into the distance because we had a lot, we had a lot of stuff on deck that we lost. Obviously, just sitting loose, like not tied yeah, down. Yeah, and, and and that's just gone. And that's just gone. And I mean, everything should be tied down, but you know, you, you get very complacent after. How many days were you out there? I think that was day twenty-eight. Okay, so after yeah, we, so we were a long long way in. We yeah. were pretty, you know, we'd be, you were very comfortable on the boat at that point. And it's like it's a question that I always struggle to answer, but I, I want to hear you try at least. Or you might have a really good answer to this. But a lot of people ask me when I do adventures, it's like, why? Yeah. You know, obviously you're raising money for an incredible cause. So I imagine that's one of your motivating factors. You've said before that when you've got clarity and purpose in your life, you feel like you're the best person, the best version of yourself. Yeah. It, what's, what's the overarching thing? If, if you weren't raising money, would you still do these things? Yeah, 100%. Okay. And, and I, I really have to be honest with myself that the, the whole black dog and the fundraising thing has been a journey. Mm -hmm. And to start with, you know, the, the idea of raising money for charity was a vehicle so that I could go off and do these things. Okay. And now it's, you know, it's flip round, right? And I feel like I do these things in order to have that platform to raise money and awareness for black dog. So it has absolutely flipped 180. But it mate, to, to answer your question, th there's two things. Number one, I know that I'm just worse off when I don't have anything to aim for. I, I really suffer from that, that 
I really struggle with being rudderless, like massively. Explain to us what that looks like for you. Like, because <clears> these, these for, for the general population, these are massive goals, you know, to row across the Atlantic, to do the MDS. These are huge goals. Yeah. And do you feel like they're the driving force that you need or do they, like, do they need to be that big of a goal? These are the questions that I get. Like, is there, what are the, what are the reasonings that you have to have those in your life? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Do they have to be that big? I don't know. I feel like they do, okay. but I'm sure they don't. <laughs> is, the, is the honest answer, right? Yeah. I think, I mean, I think like anything, it's human psyche. If you test yourself and you find that you're capable, then you want to test yourself further mm -hmm. and maybe do something that's more audacious. But I mean, not to sound cheesy, but I take as much enjoyment these days out of having a walk in the woods with my daughters and my wife or going for a surf with my mates yeah. than I maybe do doing these things. But I do feel like it's important to see how you fare on the big stage. Mm. And there's also this sort of thing of like, well, people do it. Like, why not? Why can't you? Why can't you? Yep. Right? There's, there was always that kind of why not. Mm -hmm. um, but the one thing I've found about myself, and it's the most clarifying thing, I once heard a quote that's always stuck with me, which is, when you're in these situations, it, it burns the fat off your soul. <laughs> and, I, and I just fucking love that Ooh, so that fired much. me up a little bit too. Yeah, yeah, that fired it, like, me up a little bit. Then they say it just burns the fat from your soul. And it's so true because... You know, you're disconnected from social media for mm -hmm. a start. You're you're in these places where you don't get signal, right? Your life becomes incredibly simple. Yep. You're working towards a common goal. You know, it's just there's so much that's good about it. And then when you go back, you just feel so maybe enlightened's too strong a word, but you know what I'm you know what I mean, right? I know exactly you what just, you mean. You, you just feel like it's the best feeling in the world. And I struggle to articulate it to people and that's why mm. like I love asking the questions. Because it is a very, very difficult question to like really articulate a great answer to that people can relate to. Yeah. But I think once it's a shared experience, then you sort of know why people do these things. Yeah. Fletch, I don't know if you realize this, but I realized that you were the only person in the Australian tents and I think there was eleven or twelve of us that had a family. Did you know that? No. Yeah, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think any of the boys... No, Jesus, no. no. Yeah. <laughs> I, I thought maybe... Uh, yeah. I think that might be as far away as you possibly can. But, yeah. So, yeah, I remember thinking to myself that you were... Because you... Obviously, your family is a massive core value of yours because you spoke about it over there numerous times as well, your yeah. family. And I was thinking to myself that you were the only person in those three tents of the Australian that had family. How much do these big tasks sort of play on your family life and, you know, um, taking time away. You said you obviously missed your daughter's first Christmas. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, that was heavy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 How, like, can you run me through that? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I should say as well that we, it was obviously a two-year planning event, so that was my first daughter. So I didn't sign up knowing that I was going to miss her first Christmas. <laughs> I think that's a big thing I think thing that's a big to point, identify. right? And, and, you know, we were, we were a long way in when we into the campaign. We were hundreds of thousands of dollars into the campaign before Denise and I found out we were going to be having our first daughter. I think that's great that you clarified uh, that. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's an important thing. Um, I think, firstly, m my wife's amazing. Okay. Like, she's, you know, she knows exactly who I am and what I need. Um, and she would not only not stand in my way, but she understands that, you know, it's it's a big part of who I am is going off and doing these things. That's incredible to have that support. <clears throat> yeah. But also the one thing we've found is that you, it doesn't just have to be an adventure for you, right? It can be adventure for everyone. The row is a classic example of, you know, we, we flew from Australia to London. You know, uh, Denise is also from the UK. She went to hang out with her family for six weeks. We had time in Lagomera, which is the start line in the Canary Islands. Then her and my mum flew out to Antigua and we had a month in the Caribbean. It was great. Yep. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, you know, I, I think the MDS is probably slightly different, right? <laughs> you know, some of those places we were, you probably wouldn't want your family there. I don't but, think you want to bring your family. <laughs> but I also think, <clears throat> you know, I, I think with parenting, we're all white knuckling it. You don't really know what you're doing. Or I certainly don't feel like I know what I'm doing. Yeah. So you only can just revert to what you know. And for me... It's just leading by example, right? It's it's maybe doing these things because one day they'll wake up, they'll, they'll grow up and they'll say, hey, my dad does pretty cool things and maybe there's an aspirational thing there. Yep. You know, maybe that is, maybe you're just, you're, just, you're just trying to lead by example, really. And that's, 
At least that's the way I justify it to myself. No, I think you're in, entirely right. And, and, and a lot of my work that I'm doing at the moment is teaching people to that, especially parents, that it's not selfish to do these things. You no, know, it's yeah. selfless because exactly like you said, your wife knows you well enough that she knows that these things make you a better person. Mm -hmm. So she supports that. And that that's what I try to get people to say. And I'm glad that you clarified that you didn't know that you're going to have your first child before that. For the reason being is that it didn't stop there when you had your first kid. Yeah. You know, you've got two kids now. Yeah, two kids, two kids now. now and yeah. done the MDS. So it wasn't like, oh, I did that, had the kids, now yeah. it's going to stop. Like you've continued on doing it, which I think yeah. is amazing. And also why I don't like to talk too much. I haven't got kids. And that's why I like to speak to people with families that yep. do these incredible things to show a lot of people that it is it is still possible, you know, and it isn't selfish to take time out and do these incredible things for yourself. You make yourself a better person. That makes you a better father. You know, your kids aspire. They see the things that you're capable of. It's motivating for your kids. It makes you a better partner. So I, I love hearing yeah, when I think family that. men do these things. One of the things we talk about a lot, because I... I Totally agree with you. And one of the things we talk a lot of when we, when, we, when we do our speaking events is we talk a lot about how counterintuitive it is to take on something as big as that. Mm -hmm. Because the natural reaction for someone that's not done it before is, I don't have the time. Mm -hmm. I'm bogged down with family. I'm bogged down with my career. I just don't have the time. And, and it's so interesting because the one thing that you can't really explain or you can't really experience until you've done it is if it's something that you're genuinely passionate about or something that sets your soul on fire, it, ha it, it actually is the most clarifying thing in the world. And it doesn't feel like extra work. It actually makes you a better version of yourself. You become, you know, what's, what's that Jimmy Carr quote? He says, the, you know, the pack doesn't become um, uh, heavier. Your back becomes stronger. Yeah. And when you're, when you're planning for these things, your back becomes stronger. Yeah, and incredible. I look back on my career and the times where my professional career has boosted the most has been in the six months leading up to big events. That's incredible. Because I've just been seeing it like a beach ball and I've been having something else that's just got me laser focused. And it's, like you said earlier on, right before we started recording, rising tide raises all ships. That works for everything else that's in your own ecosphere. Yeah. Like 100%. And I think that goes back to what I asked you before is like the why. You know, why do you do these things? Do they have to be that big? And like when, when they're this big, I find the clarity become like you get so much clarity when the goal is big and audacious that everything else as well it comes into focus you know your work life you the time that you spend with your family becomes a lot more quality time rather than just quantity time mm. you know like i know a bunch of people that go out on a saturday night get drunk super hungover on sunday morning and they give their kids ipads you know whereas you're rowing in the sydney harbour on a sunday morning before sun's up you know and then when you get home the quality time you spend with your kids yeah. is a lot more than just quantity time as well yeah so um so yeah i could talk about this i forever. should yeah i should i mean you'd have to ask my wife as well i think that sometimes i can be a nightmare and i think there's a single mindedness to it that's you know that I, I don't think everyone would go in for. Yeah, and that's why we don't have partners on this web. On exactly, the yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. We like to paint the perfect picture I, of I ourselves. Won't, I won't send this to her. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me about the fundraising uh, attached to the row. Yeah, so the I think the one thing to, to note about an ocean rowing boat is it's bloody expensive. I heard you say a couple hundred thousand yeah, dollars. Yeah, a couple hundred grand. Yeah. yeah, we were in for about a couple of hundred grand. Um, and so... You know, I think it was a project that we believed in and we put in seed money for it. But I think there was just this sort of, you know, there was just this overarching belief that we were so invested in the cause and what we were doing that the money would come. And it did, you know, and, and we ended up raising a lot of money. Um, but I, I, there was a couple of key moments. There was a couple of key sponsors, you know. Um, there was our headline sponsor, who's a company I'm still in touch with today and I will be forever grateful for, um, called Vivcourt, Vivcourt Trading, okay. um, run by just an incredible human being called Rob. Um, and, you know, I, I sent him a, a cold call email. We were, we were sort of quite behind in terms of, you know, the amount of money we'd raised and where we were relative to the start of the race. And I just sent him a cold call email. I said, hey, look, you're, you're a Bondi boy. We're Bondi boys. You know, this is what we're doing. This is why we're doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think two days later, I met him for a coffee. And three days later, he had, without really any question, transferred a, a relatively, well, a, a hugely significant amount of money into our account. Wow. Um, 
What did you say to him? What did you think got him across the line? I, I don't know, Rob, but I imagine you're not the first person to pitch him on a crazy idea, yep. you know, to raise money. What, what do you think you said to him that got him on board? Well, I think the first thing to, to realize about Rob is that the, the company that he runs, Vivcourt Trading, is a trading firm that's for profit, mm -hmm. but they cap, I, I believe, and I'm sorry if I've got this slightly wrong, but they cap all of their commissions for their traders. Okay. Um, and then every single cent that goes on top of that goes straight to charity. Wow. So here's a bloke who, you know, uh, has been hugely successful in his life and, and now, you know, runs this just incredible firm where they just give so much money back That's every amazing. single year. Uh, like incredible people, yeah. right? Um, and in terms of what I said to him, I mean, I, I still won't know. I mean, maybe there was just a... Maybe he smelt the desperation. <laughs> maybe he. Just I'd like to think. Pity. I'd like to think he recognised the passion, but maybe he smelt the desperation, um, which I think might have been the same for a lot of people that we associated in in the run up to the row. But yeah, I think again, you know, there's there's merit in being vulnerable, right? Mm. Putting yourself out there and saying, "Look, this is what we need," you know, and we will do absolutely everything in our power to give you a return on investment. I mean, we looked at it through business terms. We yep. weren't asking for a handout. Yeah. We were saying, we need this money right now. And if we have this money, we can do this. And then this will give us a platform to go and turn your $1 into $3. Yeah. So we looked at it through business terms. Um, but there was no guarantees for him. There was wow. absolutely no guarantees. So, you know, again, I'll be, abs I'll be forever you know, ingratiated to those guys. Did you have any um, aspirations or goals on raising X amount of money on that trip? And, and did you? No, we didn't. No, we, no had, idea. we had no, we just wanted to break even. Okay. We, we just wanted to not waste people's time. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the, the fact that we ended up raising a fair bit was, was awesome. Yeah. Do you remember how much you raised? Um, I don't, I know where we're at today. Yeah. We're, we're just shy of the halfway point. Just, just shy of just shy five hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah, that's incredible, yeah. mate. Congratulations. Thanks, that's man. Huge. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, massive. I mean, how does that feel to say that? Oh, it feels great. I mean, again, it, it feels a bit. I don't know. I, I know that I know that we're the people that rode the oceans and ran the deserts and all that kind of stuff, but it, it doesn't really mean anything without the the generosity of people that have donated, right? Yeah. So yeah, it. it I feel. I feel more thankful to those guys for everyone who's ever put a dollar away. Yeah, of course. I just and feel like hugely thankful. From me, from the outside looking in, you know, like I'm thankful that there's people out, out there like you and your team of guys that are doing this that will go and put in the work, you know, two years of work to raise that money, you know, and plus MDS, which we're going to talk about next. But like, it's incredible that you've done that. You should be, uh, oh, I'm it was sure amazing. You are. I, I think a big thing that the guys, uh, we, we work with a few people and we work with, you know, leadership coaches and we, I mean, 35 days I mean the, the, the rowing um, the actual area that you're rowing is as big as this table That's so it's, a, it's, a, it's the size of a sofa so for 30 for 34 35 days you're going from here for two hours and then you're lying down here for two hours and in that two hours you've got to eat you've got to sleep you've got to clean yourself you've got to do everything you've got to do and then mm. you're back on um, you know you've got to be pretty tight with the people that, you, that you're actually on that ship with, right? <laughs> yeah. so we work with leadership coaches we work with relationship coaches we did everything right um to to kind of work through those things and, and we just became tighter and tighter but i think we had we one of the things that one of the leadership coaches said was make it bigger than just the four of you oh that's good right um so that when you really feel like you're in it which we were and i know you will know this you know if ever that kind of those those negative self thoughts creep in. You're doing it for someone more than just yourself, or more than just those other three blokes on uh, blokes on the boat. Yeah. So so we we really did a lot, or we tried as hard as we could do to get that community as big as possible. Be it our corporate sponsors, be it our friends, be it our family. So really, when we got on that boat, you know, there was 25, 30 people on there, right? Not just the four of us. And there's there's a lot of power in that public accountability and that's when people are working towards big goals you know that's mm -hmm. why they say it and i think the bigger the best example ever of public accountability was muhammad ali when he came out and he said i'm the best boxer in the world this is well before he was any good at boxing yeah. and he said i'm the best boxer in the world and he told the entire world that you know every mic that he got i'm the best boxer in the world I'm the... and then when you build that public accountability when you step into training when you step on that rowboat you know when you're doing those things you have all of that public accountability on your shoulders some people can rise to that some people hate public accountability. Yeah. For you guys, having the public accountability of people investing their money into you, 
you know, to do this thing. I can imagine that would have been very powerful. Yeah, it was, it was, it was intimidating because yeah. we'd never done anything before. Again, uh, you know, we had a rowing coach down at uh, UTS. You know, the, I don't know if you know it, but there's a UTS rowing club down at Harbourfield. You know, there's future Olympians out of there. And then there's four <laughs> hackers in the corner, you know, twice as old as the, the athletic teenagers that are down there. And, and Tim McLaren, the head coach there, you know, who is an incredible guy who's worked with, you know, he's been part of, I, I forget if it's the Oxford or the Cambridge rowing setup. You know, he's, he's an elite coach. Yeah. You know, he's architected gold medals at the Olympics. You know, he, he for whatever reason, took us under his wing. Yeah. Right? And I think it was literally because he did not want to see us die. You know, I think he literally said, if I don't do something here, you guys are going to, we're never going to see you again. So, you know, so having those guys, you know, not, you know, not wanting to let those people down that invested time in us was a big thing as well. That's amazing. Yeah. Before we move on to your next big challenge, have you got a single like standout moment, something that you want to share like from that row? Like, is there something that you've taken away from that row? A moment, a lesson, anything? You You don't have to, but if there's anything that you've taken away from that race... I think, well, I think two things. I think in terms of the, the moment that I will always remember is crossing the finish line. Okay. Like, you know, we, it, was, it was very strange. We smelt the land before we saw it. Really? Like that's how kind of in tune you, you become. Are you saying that seriously or are yeah, you? Yeah, 100%. You, you, we, you could smell the land before you could see the land. So we saw, we saw Antigua about, I think it was about 10 to 12 hours out. Okay. Um, and we saw it at first light and then... By, I think we, we got in at sunset, okay. which made for some great photos. Like we couldn't have nailed that any better. Um, but yeah, but, but before that, and through the night, I remember thinking the whole thing just smells different. Just You're the temperature, kidding. yeah, and it just smells different. Probably from about 150 k's out. But, but, but coming into English Harbour in Antigua was just, I, 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 will, get, I will forever have goosebumps. Wow. We, you, you, we had a bit of a flotilla of boats around us that had sort of come to join us for the, for the last sort of journey in. Um, you turn into the harbour and, you know, there's just this imaginary finish line that sits across the entrance of the harbour and there's someone that just sits up on a hill that just raises it. I think it's a white flare or something. So it's all this pandemonium around you and um, and then we were rowing, just all looking up on this hill and then you just see the white flag go up and it's 35 days. It's a long, long fucking time. Man, and, I, I don't know if and that was it. F- fully comprehend then, just how long that is at sea and then just and then just the the oars go down and that the the, the first hug like the hug with the boys yeah first thing you do is you take your emergency flares and you let them off because okay. you don't need your emergency flares anymore <laughs> so so sitting there all four of us in the boat holding our emergency flares up and then and then taking a trip past all these super yachts and all the crews had come out on their super yachts and they were all honking their horns as we rowed through the oh, harbor wow. and then there would have been 150 people including all of our family and friends that were just waiting for us in the dock um, I'll, I'll, I'll never forget that moment, like as long as I live. What are the emotions? What are they? You know, were you proud? Were you, you know, uh, yeah, obviously you're ecstatic, you're happy, but yeah. like what, what were some of the emotions that you remember feeling? We, 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 I, I remember feeling that I was, I, I don't think I've ever been, uh, outside the birth of my two daughters and, and getting married, I've never felt as proud in that moment as I did because we set out to do something audacious mm. and really we shouldn't have done it. Just four idiots who just drank <laughs> in the same pub, decided to do something, were totally ill-equipped to do it, but found a way and, and kept falling and then found another way and then kept falling and then, found, and then ended up finishing second in the race, you know, behind, uh, you know, behind a crew that weren't actually far off the entire world record, right? I think they were like a day behind the world record or something. Wow. Um, and, and I was just, uh, but the one thing I was most proud of is we, we really, we, we worked really hard on a set of core values for the, for the, for the boat and for the team. Mm-hmm. And, and the, the first thing about those core values was we want to ride into Antigua with our heads held high, still as really good mates, knowing that we've tried our absolute hardest. That was like number one. Yeah. And, you know, other crews, including military crews fell apart. They all had mutinies. They had arguments and, you know, bar a few kind of terse words, we, we, we were all sweet the whole way across. And, and, and so it's, it's the adherence to those core values really is the thing that I'm most proud of. Right, that's incredible. Yeah. That gives me goosebumps thinking about yeah. that. Yeah, oh yeah. And uh, you know, and it, it, you can do it, right? Anyone can do it. Yeah. There was nothing special about us. <laughs> there, I, can't, I, can't, I cannot 
overstate that point. There was nothing special about us at all. And right, yeah, I don't know if the proof's there to, to back that statement up. You know, like second team to cross the line, yeah. Australian record. I, I, you guys I mean, you, you have to remember people. as well, there's probably about nine crews in the history of Australia that have tried this. So, <laughs> Leave that out. You know, That's yeah. irrelevant. If you go niche enough, you'll always find a record somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so after that, uh, how long was it between when you finished that? I don't want to brush over it, but how long was it from when you finished that to when you were like, there needs to be another thing, the, the, the next thing? What was the time frame? I think probably two, two years, okay. I think. S- yeah. Sorry, I just want to back up because it's something that I've dealt with recently. When you came back from that 35 days at sea alone without you know, family, friends, stuff like that. How long did it take you to assimilate back to just normal life? Were you straight back into normal life? Did yeah, good you, question. Like, did it take you time to get back to being Fletch, normal Fletch? Um, I think aside from re-assimilating to land life, like the one thing that's really interesting is you, you can't walk straight for the first two days being back on land. Wow. You, 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 you literally, the moment you're back on the boat, you're fine. And then the moment you try and walk in a straight line from A to B, it's like you've had ten pints. That sounds sickening. Yeah, it's so it's it's just a bit it's just a it's just a strange phenomenon, right? Yeah. So I guess it's an inner ear thing. But um, but no, I, I I was, you know, we we talked a lot about this as a as a group. I think it's surpri- It's always surprising how quickly you reassimilate. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you, you make all these grandiose things about the fact that you'll never ever take anything for granted again, and then it takes about two weeks before you're waiting five minutes longer than you'd like to be for your latte (laughs) and you're getting annoyed right and i think that's the interesting the interesting thing is that i found about the row is how elastic you are as a human being Mm -hmm. and you know you take the two on two off for example like at the end of the first week i've never been that tired in my life like you're just operating on zero sleep but by the end of the row it was just the most normal thing in the world you'd finish your shift you get off the oars, didn't matter what time it was, whether it was middle of the day or, or in the middle of the night, clean yourself down, grab a bite to eat, just doze off for 35 minutes, wake back up feeling fresh as days, you get back on the oars. And, and your body was just so adaptable. But it, so it's great in that you can adapt so quickly to these incredible things, but it obviously works the other way. You know, the moment you've, you know, the moment you're back in your air conditioned car and you know, you've got all your creature comforts, you, you, you really do, you assimilate, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah it didn't take me as long as I would have hoped. <laughs> what about you? What did well, you find out? Well, we'll touch on this later. Let's <laughs> okay, talk about MBS okay, because okay. I had a very, very similar experience. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so about two years after the Atlantic crossing, what spurred on the, hey, there's the next challenge and how did you land on Marathon de Saab? How did you land on MDS? Um, so, yeah, I think, again, back to what we were talking about earlier on, you do something... And it just gives you a taste. Mm-hmm. You know, I think, and I keep saying this to my wife, Denise, oh yeah, it's, it's scratched the itch. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I scratched the itch like I'm cool now. And actually it's not, it just gives you more of a taste. <laughs> and so it's, it's a horrible sort of self-perpetuating thing, really. I say horrible, I mean horrible for her and the people around you, right? Because, Great for you. <laughs> you know, because yeah, for you, you're like, right, brilliant, what's next? Yeah. Um, we, we, we tried to do a couple of things, actually. We, okay. We, we actually, um, we, we tried to get a Sydney Hobart thing off the ground. Yeah. Where we, um, where we basically were going to get a maxi yacht. We were going to get a crew. And then we were going to have spots for paying people. Okay. Um, as, a, as another vehicle to, um, to raise money for Black Dog, right? Okay. It was a really, it was big audacious. And we had a lot of sponsorship. It was, it was like, right, we've done that on the road. This is going to be the thing that takes us straight to a million because the numbers that we were talking about were huge. Yeah. And it was just absurd that we were all of a sudden got back from the row and then all of a sudden we're, you know, standing on the decks of these 80 foot maxi yachts in the harbor, you know, talking about how much it is to rent them for the Sydney Hobart, <laughs> right? Talking to world-class <laughs> skippers, right? And and just 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 like some of us didn't even know parts of what parts of the boat were called, right? <laughs> so and it was interesting because everything that went right with the row went wrong with the Sydney Hobart. Oh, wow. Expedition. How interesting. And it was a real lesson in humility, actually, because, I don't know, because we just sort of opened ourselves up for the row and, and whatever we put out, we got back tenfold, mm-hmm. right? And people's kindness and generosity and stuff. We just didn't really find that for the Sydney Hobart. Okay. So it, it, we got quite a lot. We got very far down the road. But it sounds like, yeah. But it came to the point where we were going to have to start writing some big checks with not our money. 
mm. and we just didn't feel confident that we were going to return that or get it across the line or you know it just it just didn't feel like a sound investment okay so right at the 11th hour we pulled the pin wow we collapsed the whole thing down like we had crews ready to go and everything it was it was it was brutal actually so that kind of dampened it a little bit and in hindsight the right thing to do 100 percent. okay great 100 okay great yeah. so and that and that was one of the things that i've sort of learned is if it doesn't feel good there's a reason you know, intuition's powerful, mm -hmm. right? And you might not be able to articulate it, but sometimes it's just like, if it doesn't feel right, you've got to get out of there. Yeah. You know, there's merit in grit, but there's also merit in trusting yourself, right? Yeah. Um, so that kind of dampened it a little bit and that put it on ice. But the, the Marathon de Salle was exactly the same. Like there was Johnny who you met, you know, who, who ended up doing really well. Incredibly right? well. Incredibly, yeah. yeah. Um, let's hope he doesn't listen to this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, he... Um, you know, we, him and I had been talking, and I think it might have been him that said, you know, I'd, I'd always wanted to do this. And I'd, I'd heard of it yeah. because I just, I was just on a whole thing of just Googling the hardest races in the world. Like yeah. anything with the word hardest in it. You were like... I was like, sign me interested, up. Interested, interested. Yeah. You know, and there was, there was a nice kind of poetic duality with, you know, we've done the ocean, now let's do the desert, something along that. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, it was only when Johnny and I sat down and I realized that he was really keen to do it. And then we sort of got to talking. And again, it was, you know, why the hell not? And I'm not a runner. I've never really been a runner. Um, so it was just another one of those things where it's like, yeah, this is something to train towards. It's a new thing. And you'll know this, right? It's When you start with something like that, it's never, oh my God, I want to be, we can do this race and I want to finish in the top 100 or mm -hmm. top 200. It's, I wonder what it's like to sleep out under the stars yeah, in the yeah, middle yeah. of the Sahara Desert. Yeah. Or I wonder what it's like to put yourself in the locker, you know, on an 85K day, having run 45Ks, 30Ks the day before. Yeah. You know, it's, that, it's, the, it's the curiosity of being in that part of the world and the experience that kind of really sucks you in. And again, then it was just, we had two of us. It was just a case of finding... So it was you and Johnny to begin me with? Me and Johnny. Yeah. Gracie was, you know, Ryan is, you know, again, he's always going to say yes. Yeah. Yeah, whether he's equipped to do it or not, he's always going to say yes. Yeah, and then uh, and then one one of Ryan's mates, Dino. Yeah, you know, yeah, we we got him involved as well. And obviously, the four of you came across. You raised money again through there. Yep. Yeah. And yep. how did you go about raising money for MDS? So the MDS was was it was a different mechanism. Okay. Um, we it was a lot more asking for people's money than asking for corporates. Okay. Um. Um. I don't know. It's one of those things where we didn't feel comfortable going to ask for big sums because we didn't think that there was potentially the return on investment. Okay. Uh, and by that, I mean, when we did the row, we got national media coverage. You know, mm. we were in Daily Mail. You know, we got um, featured in Men's Health magazine, which is just... Oh, I'd love to see that. ...absurd if you saw me with my top off. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know that I'm the least likely candidate to appear in an article in Men's Health. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, we, you know... So with that one, it was a lot more about, you know, with the cup out going around. Yeah. But also off the back of the row, we, we did a lot of speaking events. Mm -hmm. we, we do a lot of speaking events for corporates. We talk about, um, you know, we talk about our journey. We talk about the 35 days and what we did. We do a lot of team building because we talk about, you know, how to maintain solid relationships under, you know, extreme amounts of duress. Yeah. Um, but we also just talk about what the road less traveled is, which is, you know, a group of very unremarkable people trying to do remarkable things and put ourselves, you know, in adventurous situations and in uh, situations where we have to self-improve as an antidote to suffering, and feelings of being, you know, disengaged, disenfranchised and, and, and numb and bored with your day-to-day -day life. Mm. You know, to me, stress is, is boredom. Right, it's 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 feelings of disengaged. That's that's just my own personal experience. Of course, with it. yeah. How important do you think it is for the events that you do to face adversity and suffering when you are raising money for Black Dog? Like, if it was something, you know, where it didn't involve being under massive amounts of duress, do you think you'd still have the same, I suppose, response as you do with putting yourself in really hard positions? It's a really good question. I don't know. I think there's two things. I think you want something that loosely aligns with the cause. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think it's, you know, you, you, you've, you're trying to do something that captures the attention. Right? Yeah, okay. You know, um, 
and this might be a really personal question, how much has it had an impact on your mental wellness doing these events? Like, do you feel like it's had an upkick in your mental wellness? It's a, it's a really interesting question. Because I, 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 we were talking about this before we came on, in that I, you know, when we first started this, I don't think I really understood what mental health or mental illness was. Mm-hmm. I, I, I said I did, but I really didn't. For me, mental illness was depression and it was suicide and it was the extreme end of the spectrum mm-hmm. and and what I've come to learn is it's 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 everything in between right it's uh, you know I think it's one in five Australians suffer from some form of mental health disease and that could be anything from you know mild anxiety all the way through to outright depression um, and and for me it's a really interesting question because I definitely am my best person and my best self when I've got something to train for. Mm-hmm. But the one thing I'm trying to work on at the moment is maybe trying to be my best person or my best self without having those things, right? And that's a really tough thing. Yeah. So I don't know. In some aspects, it's great because when I'm training for something, I've got clarity and I'm brilliant and I'm engaged and I'm present. But the two months after, when I'm rudderless or I've got nothing else to train for, I can be a bit of a nightmare. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. really interesting. Do you find the same? Yeah. So I think like um, what you're referring to, they, they call like gold medal depression. You, you have all of this purpose and clarity working towards this one big audacious goal of running MDS, rowing the Atlantic. And then when you achieve it, it's like, well, what next? Mm. I heard this incredible quote. It was like, it wasn't a quote, a Claudia, Claudine, Claudia Chi, I think her name is. She's won seven world titles, Taekwondo. And she said after the fifth one, she was like, I knew I was enough but I knew I wasn't done. Mm. And I remember when she said that and I've always thought, and people joke about it when you do these things constantly. It's like, well, you have to do it to prop yourself up. And I started to fall into this trap like, shit, am I only having these events to mask my mental like um, wellness (laughs) to keep propping myself up? And when I heard her say that, like then she, she was talking about getting to a point where you are enough, but you know you're not done. And I was like, I love that now because now I can say to myself, I'm really proud of all the things that I've accomplished and what I'm doing, but I'm not done. There's still more that I want to do. And it's not just to fill my own cup up. It's not to mask anything. It's just I've got to a point now that I want to do these things for me, not to prove anything. And I think that's a really hard balance because until I heard it put it in those words, I found I was incredible leading up to the event, do the event, immediate despair, you know, (laughs) emptiness, you know, loss of clarity, quickly enter the next event and then feel good again, you know, and that was something that That's I really interesting. address. So, how, so you're doing, so you're gearing up for UTMB, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how would you feel if for whatever reason you couldn't do UTMB now? So I actually almost didn't do UTMB after <laughs> MDS. Right, so, okay, wow. Um, I, I, I've spoke about this, but I'll, I'll tell you the story. At MDS... I, that was my, I'm not a runner either. Like I've only been running for the last 18 months, I two years. Differ, but yeah, go on. <laughs> <laughs> and I, MDS was always my end goal. So that was what I was sort of, that was my last ultra marathon and I was going to put my shoes down there. And I was going to just be done with running. I, I just always wanted to do MDS and then that was it for me. And then because of UTA, which is Ultra Trail Australia and Ultra Trail Cozzy, I got enough lottery tickets to go into the lottery for UTMB. And because I had immersed myself in the trail running world, I learned about UTMB. And I was like, that is a cool event. It's the Zenith, right? Yeah, it's yeah. the Super Bowl. It's the big sort of um, final achievement tick in trail running, essentially. Because I did the races prior, I earned the potential to go into the lottery and then I got picked in the lottery. So then that's in uh, August this year. I was like, well, shit, I got picked. I have to do it now. And then when I was at MDS, I had obviously a lot of time to think, you know, because I was alone for a lot of the time. And I thought the only reason I'm doing UTMB is because of scarcity, because I know tens of thousands of people tried to get in and didn't, and I did. So that was a motivating factor for me. And then it was... Other than that, I didn't really know what I was doing. I, it was never something I wanted to do. I never like was driving to do UTMB. I didn't do those races to get the lottery tickets, to go in the lottery, to get a spot. So then it was just like, well, I've got this opportunity that I don't really want, that I know other people would kill for, so I have to do the race. Mm. And at MDS, when I got home um, after like a few days after we left Was Is That, I called my missus. I was like, hey, I'm not going to do UTMB. 
because the week before my wife she's doing uh she's doing the trail over five days she's doing it solo and she's sleeping in the refugees along the way right so you go up into the mountains and you sleep there and you run the next yeah. day so she's doing the 170 k's over five days I thought, you know what, that's a beautiful part of the world through the Alps. I'll just yeah. do it with my wife. You can connect with her. You, you can, can still do it. You can see you're not you're not in the hurt locker. You're not missing half of the course because it's at night and you're running through the night. You get to see all the views. I thought, I have zero interest in doing UTMB. So I almost pulled the pin on it. But you're still doing it. Well, my wife booked all the refuges and there was room in a lot of them for one person because we booked so late. Gotcha. So I couldn't do it with her. <laughs> <laughs> and then I thought, Fuck, well, I'm not going to not see it if she's doing it. Yeah. So now I'm doing UTMB. But my my big thing was it's not a very intrinsically motivated goal for me. Yeah. It's a lot more externally motivated, yeah. which I'm not okay with. And it's something that I like steer a lot of people to do is find that intrinsic goal, what yeah. it means to you. So what I've coined UTMB for me now is my it's my um, victory lap. Yeah. It's I I've been really proud of all the stuff that I've done with running and I did MDS which was like my A race. I got this incredible opportunity and like, you know, I get to run from France into Italy into Switzerland. Yeah, what an opportunity. So hey. I, I'm going to go there with a big smile on my face. You know, it's going to be my victory lap and I honestly don't know how it's going to go. I won't not do the training. I'll do all the training necessary, you know, it's sort of just in my personality type to do that. But it is something I'm really struggling with. It's not an intrinsically motivating goal for me to do UTMB. It, I just am doing it because it's scarcity and a lot of people want to do it. Yeah. And I can't transfer my ticket to anyone. Either. Oh, is that right? You yeah. can't do that. Well, then, the first well, thing then, I ask. Yeah, you, you're doing it for everyone. Because I'd, I'd, I'd love to do that, but I can never see myself really you know, going down that route to the point that you have, right? So, yeah. Yeah, man, do it for us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> do it for everyone. <laughs> hey, yeah. just quickly before we wrap this up, because we've been going almost an hour. Uh, what are some of the lessons that transferred from the row across MD we didn't talk too much about MDS but across into MDS you know and then yep. also what are the lessons that you've learned from that that help you in everyday life in business being a father being a being a husband being a partner like what what are some of the lessons that you take away from these yeah wow i think definitely the 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 lens with which i viewed the marathon the Saab was it's you know, again, it's an expedition that you run on. It's not a running race. Mm -hmm. And I think that was a big thing, right? For me, it was, you know, all the just micro things that you learn on the road, trying to be comfortable in uncomfortable situations. And by that, I just mean, you know, having the right sleeping mat and, you know, like little things like I just didn't have to worry about my food. Like we spent so much time researching what food we were going to take on the row. Mm -hmm. There's an American company called Outdoor Herbivore, right, which does vegan products and what they lack in meat, they just make up for and just absolutely being completely delicious and all that kind of. So like just just little things like I knew exactly what food I was going to take. Yeah. I know I knew exactly what my body needed throughout one day just to get me through yeah. five or six hours of running, right? Um, so you learn a lot about how you how you operate in those situations. Mm -hmm. There was the only real unknowns were were my legs going to were going to were they going to hold up, right? And we spoke a lot about this because it was the first time that you'd ever camped, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So fair play to you for that because <laughs> that's insane. Um, but I've spent a lot of nights out, you know, in the middle of an ocean or I've spent a lot of nights on the side of a mountain. I've spent a lot of cold nights in weird places. So I just knew that all that stuff was taken care of. So there was a lot of transferable stuff across there. Mm -hmm. And I just knew that I could have I, I, I knew full well that I could have been out there for three weeks and I would have been absolutely fine. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So it was just came down to all I really had to do for the MDS was just run. That okay. was my training plan was just run. Yeah. And the rest would take care of itself. That's awesome. Having that confidence. Knowing yeah, that there was a, which I never thought I'd have. Right. Yeah. And, you know, we, we talk a lot about that, that sort of confidence that you don't realize you have. And, and it's only doing these things that you just one day in the future, you go, oh, actually I can do that. And it's because of something that you might have done one or two years or three years before. Yeah. So I think there's, there's, there's definitely that. Um, I think enjoying it for what it is. I think, you know, we had a lot of big, um, and I know you felt this as well, you know, there was that massive thing of not wanting to wish the experience away. Mm. I think that, I think the big thing is, is when you're in the hurt locker, all you want to do is it, you just want it to be over. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's the same in life. If you're going through a shitty period or, if you are, um, you know, not having a particularly good time or works hard or whatever, this you, you just want to, 
you don't want to face up to the problem. You want to you want to ostrich it and just put your head in the sand. But the the whole idea is, you know, that the is it roomy or it might be a roomy quote or someone that the, this too shall pass, right? And the whole thinking of however shit it is right now, ten minutes down the line, it's going to be okay. Yeah. Or however good it is. Or however good it is. Okay. That's the other thing, yeah. right? Yeah. However good it is, you're going to feel shitty in a, in a while. So yeah. it's it's definitely, you know, the. Bit trying to be as zen as possible about the whole thing, but just trying to accept it for where I am. And I am most present when I'm in those situations. But we take a lot of that into parenting. Yeah. Like when kids aren't sleeping, like you just got to remember it's just a phase because it feels like it's never going to fucking end <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but but actually it might only be a week, right? Yeah. So just just trying to do that. I think that's the big thing that we took into. I mean, the Marathon de Saab is just such an insane right it's such an insane event isn't it it is ridiculous it, it, I, th- I think we spoke about it while we were over there we thought the hardest foot race on earth a bit of a gimmick you know marketing ploy and you know i still don't think it's the hardest foot race on earth but i now i understand why they say that yeah it's like oh to your point before it's attrition it, it's you know can you deal with the sand can you deal with the heat can you deal with the rationing the water plus you've got to run 250 kilometers plus you're sleeping in you know six to eight people in in an exposed tent you know did you so. did you have a um did you have a moment i had a moment and i've never felt this before and i've heard about it people you know runners and people that talk about the sort of the out of body experience mm-hmm. i did, i had one of those tell me tell me well, it was the day after the long stage mm-hmm. on the on the marathon, marathon stage, stage yeah and i just i don't know what happened but i just on the on the end of the the long stage i was i was fucked mm-hmm. and I was really battling, like everything hurt. And then I woke up on that morning at that fourth stage and I, I just, the moment I opened my eyes, I was like, today is going to be an incredible day. Wow. And 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 I've got it on my phone. I, I had to keep, ta- keep taking videos to remind myself of that moment because yeah. I was, uh, there was points when I was running, you know, um, 5.20, 5.10 minute Ks through the sand at like 35 Ks in, just feeling absolutely incredible filming myself saying you've got to remember this moment because i've got no idea what's going on right now i remember you running past me yeah i remember, Do you remember you, that yeah we were going along that fence line up and down the hills yeah, exactly. and i remember and i had, i hadn't seen you in the days prior yeah and you came through with a massive smile on your face and you were flying yeah and you, and it, it's a, it's the weirdest thing and i still can't accept it it lasted right up until the point where the leading pack ran past us <laughs> yeah because they started behind because <laughs> yeah. they started yeah. now behind us and 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 me running through the desert I was right I was really alone by that point no one else around me and I was shouting at the top of my voice no one's ever run this fast <laughs> and then seeing seeing the three the two brothers and the, the other guy and and it was like I was it was like I was in treacle <laughs> and so that was quite humbling but yeah but I, I just I've never experienced anything but again like that's how many days do you live in your life where you'll never remember it mm. and I'll I'll remember you know there might be there might be I'll, I'll remember the race and I'll remember certain things about it, but though that like two hour period, I'll always remember that of just having a genuine transcending experience where all the pain just went away and I just, I felt like the best I've ever felt running. It's what a really feeling crazy. as well. Yeah. well I, I do have a moment, but mine's, very, mine's actually quite different to yours. Mine was on the long stage at night and yeah. the way I've explained it to people was like, you know when you get up in the middle of the night and obviously... The long stage, just for people listening, is 85K, 85K days, right, right in the middle of the race, right? So yep. day three. Third right? day yeah. and longest. So the only night, the only time that we ran at night. And I remember being alone at night. And I had a feeling, you have a feeling when you get up in your, in your house and it's dark everywhere, you might have a flight or something and you've got to get up at 3 a.m. at a weird time. And you feel like you're the only person awake in the world, you know, like it just, your, your streets quiet, your house is pitch black and it, you feel quite lonely and vulnerable. And I remember thinking out there, I was by myself running in the dark in the Sahara desert with my head torch lighting up a square meter in front of me. And I remember thinking, I feel like I'm the only person awake on this planet, you know, yeah. in the universe. Like I felt so exposed and alone and dark, but no fear, you know, like yeah. it was, it was this really... Mm, I don't know. It was this very present, no distractions. Obviously, I was exhausted as well, you know, so I probably wasn't thinking perfectly clear. But it was just like, a, and I'll never forget that feeling. Yeah. It was like I felt like I was the only person on this planet at that time, yeah. which was an incredible feeling. I, I love it. that. Yeah. I think it's an interesting thing because I speak to some people about the row and the run, and I'm sure you do the same. And a lot of people are very, not dismissive, but they're just like, not for me. Like I can't see myself doing that, and and I, 
and it's an interesting thing back to your earlier question around does it have to be something audacious mm -hmm. and the answer is no but i also want to meet the person who would turn up at the mds if they absolutely had to give it a go and wouldn't come out the other side saying oh my god that's incredible mm. like the idea of these things is so daunting and you want to almost talk yourself out of it but if you were forced to do it you would turn out it's just such an these things are such incredible experiences i really want to meet the person that would actually go through with it and then say no i'm i actually regret it <laughs> yeah yeah. because yeah, i yeah. don't think that person exists yeah i, I couldn't agree and, more and that's why i always say to people that, that the hardest part of anything is just signing up mm. it's because the moment you sign up and you re when i say sign up i mean committing to it yep, yep. right it, you find a way 100%. and and you know, you know, there's, there's, there's the most elite athletes in the world in the MDS and there's people that walk the whole thing, yeah. right? There's the full spectrum of people. So it's not an exclusive race. Same with the, I mean, maybe the road, but they're all, all these things are not exclusive. Mm. Anyone can do them. And you, anyone does do them. And everyone yeah. does do yeah, them, yeah, 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 right? Yeah, and you just have to have that one thing that just says, you know what, fuck it. Actually, this time, I'm just going to do it. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. Mate, let's, uh, let's wrap it up there. You said before that you do corporate speaking as well. We do, yeah, yeah. Yep. And you mentioned anything that you do corporate speaking that goes back to Black Dog as well. Is that right? It, correct. Yeah, okay. we we don't charge speaking fees. We just we just you know we say whatever you would pay. Yeah. Just put it to a donation to Black Dog. That's because that's a good way to kind of keep the pot running in between doing these events. And a question that I hate when people ask me, but what's next for um <laughs> yeah. for the road less traveled? Is there anything? Anything in the works at the moment? Um, no, I mean, we're all doing... There's, there's some interesting things, actually. We, one of the lads who did the row is just on the shitbox rally. Oh, I don't know what that is. Um, it's a, it's a, oh, the car rally. The car rally yeah, across yeah, Australia. Yeah, 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 so you yeah. have to have a, a car that's less than a grand. Yeah. Oh, and he did it with his this. old man. Oh, it's incredible. So th there's, there's this idea that, um, you know, it doesn't have to be something where you physically exert yourself. It could just be a cool thing to do in a car, yeah. right? So I thought that was really cool. Um, I don't know. For me, I, for me, for a long time, Everest was always the goal. Okay. And, I, and for one reason or another, I think there's a lot of environmental and a lot of social issues that go around Everest. Mm -hmm. um, maybe that's not as appealing as it would be, but definitely an 8,000 meter peak. Yep. I think to, to stand a, on the top of a mountain or one of the highest mountains of the world, I think would be damn cool. But right now, you know, probably just honouring my promise to my wife that I'm not going to do anything for the next couple of years. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, which that that might be a challenge in itself. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we'll see. Well, um, Fletch, thank you so much for giving us your time, mate. It's incredible what you've done. Congratulations well, on getting you too, halfway man. To, Jesus. to your big audacious goal of a million dollars. And there's no doubt in my mind that you're going to hit it. And hopefully, you know, as they go, we can chat up, chat about it even more so and yeah, talk about mate. some events well, coming up. Absolutely, man. Yeah. And congratulations. You were a... You, were, you knocked it out of the park at the end, yes. Appreciate that. Good on you. Thanks, Fletch. Thanks, mate. Cheers.